welcome also from my side. Oh, yeah, it's not working yet, but I think now it's working. Yeah, I, I guess you all can hear me in the back, right? Yeah, I see you nodding. Okay, so my uh, Andrew introduced me really great, and uh, I, I want to share one thing, which is my background in Agile, or my main focus is on well, kind of what Mary was talking about today. Um, so applying Agile in a large setting and also in, in a distributed setting. And I'm saying this not only maybe for advertising those two books I wrote, um, but also for motivating what's my interest in this topic about sociocracy because whenever you're applying Agile in the large, you are also dealing with the organization. And having an organization that allows agility is something completely different. Also in terms of what does it mean scaling into for the organization, not only scaling in terms of the project. So my interest turned into what helps, hinders an agile organization. And with that, um, um, on that focus are also my two newer books, which is the Retrospectives for Organizational Change and then the other one, uh, which I wrote together with Jana Rothman on Cost of Delay. If you are interested in those, I brought a few copies with me. Um, okay, as much for advertisement here. <laughs> Starting with the context, so my little agenda that I brought here, um, and the context, so geography, is maybe a really strange term. And people often think, well, is this something to do with socialism? No, it doesn't have to do anything with that. It just means socius is the companion and cretin, so this is Greek, and I'm not fluent in Greek at all, right? Is to govern. So what it actually means is dynamic governance. And we also heard at the opening speech uh, the one from the government talking about holacracy and maybe the one or the other had heard of that. So I don't want to go into detail here. We can talk about this in the Q&A or maybe during the break. Um, the only thing that I want to say here is that holacracy has sociocracy at its core. So if you know holacracy and some of the things I'm sharing here sound familiar, then you know why. Okay, so that's the one thing. The other thing is what do I observe when looking at Agile at the organizational level? I see different kinds of struggles and they all have to do with self-organization. Self-organization just seems to be hard for a company to allow, and it's kind of okay for a team or any project, but enabling self-organization throughout the whole of company just seems to be really hard. And some of the, the struggles that I am seeing is one of them is getting the full buy-in for a decision. So it starts off that it seems that some of the decisions have magically appeared and you don't know really who has decided upon or maybe you were part of the discussion but are surprised how the decision then turned out because you thought you talked about something completely different but often you don't even know who has decided it and what's the rationale behind that and therefore there isn't the full buy-in from everyone from the people there um, so which also goes to to the direction that often decisions are not transparent. I mean, the decision making isn't transparent, <laughs> which again doesn't help for the buy-in. If you don't know why things have been decided that way, then it's not helpful for me. And the last thing is that often a hierarchy, which is how a lot of organizations are structured, is preventing self-organization, and with that it's also hindering agility. So these are the struggles I've observed and I believe sociocracy provides really a great means for um, addressing those struggles and that's why I believe it's a super match with the Agile. Okay, decision making. So full buy-in, I, I said already, so that the problem is often, well, a decision is made and then people are not really carrying it forward and they are overwhelmed with it and they are not supporting it. And this is, is one of the 
the big problems because whenever a decision is made and there is not a full buy-in, then the decision will, decision will not be implemented. And now what, what can be done about this or rather how are decisions made? So first of all, what I think is really important is to recognize that not every decision should be or is needed to be made in the same way. So different things that are at stake can be decided upon in different ways and that can be acknowledged. However, very often we have like one way of making a decision. Um, I'm coming back to that just in a, a few seconds. The other thing is that some things are not ready for a decision, which is also a, a big problem. We all have heard, I guess, we all have heard from Lean, so deciding on the last responsible moment, but this is not always happening in organizations. Often in a company, people think like, oh, we really have to decide on that, but maybe we don't have the information ready yet, or we don't have the right people here who can help making a good decision. So these are all things that make it hard. Now, in terms of how to make a decision, but what kind of decision-making strategies come to your mind? Any? Voting, dot voting. Dot voting is uh, something that's very well known. We use it a lot, for example, in retrospectives. And what it has underneath as a strategy is actually, um, well, decision based on maturity or also sometimes labeled as democratic decisions. So the good thing about that is that all the voices get heard and it's kind of fast, at least if you make it like that voting to people pull there, that that's there, and that's, that's cool. The bad thing is that the minority votes are lost, often completely lost. We just go with the majority, and so we, are, we don't even listen to what the minority has to say about that. Anything else? Any other decision-making strategy which is coming to your mind? Consensus. Consensus, yeah. Consensus is like we all agree to what we decide upon. We are all in favor for that, which is the thing that creates typically absolute full buy-in. However, it takes often very long because till we all agree to something, it takes a while. So we make that decision in a way it's, it's okay for all of us. Then maybe at the op opposite end, we have autocratic decisions, which are like one person saying, okay, we are going this way, which is very fast. And on the other hand, which often creates that biggest struggle in terms of buy-in because it's only one person who has decided it that way. And maybe I agree with that decision, so I'm fine, but maybe I don't, and nobody ever listened to me, which is frustrating then. So that's uh, another way. Then uh, maybe, let's say, one more, which is uh, magic or random, so we can throw a dice. <laughs> well, sometimes that's good enough, right? Um, and the, the way uh, in sociocracy, how we are making decisions is based on consent, which is another way of make, making a decision. It has nothing to do with, well, nothing is maybe too strong, but it doesn't have much to do with consensus, because the question here is not, do we all agree, are we all in favor for that thing that we are deciding upon, but we are asking if we believe if we go this way, if, what, if our bigger goal is put at risk. So it's more a question about can we tolerate that decision and not so much can we favor, are we in favor for that decision? Which is, a, at least to me, a completely different question. And the, the really good thing about this, it's making obvious what kind of decisions we are really making in every day. So often we believe when we make a decision, especially in a, in a team and a crew, we think we have to come up with the best decision. However, that's not possible. And actually we will never know only in hindsight if this was the best decision. We will never know in advance. 
And therefore, because we want to make the best decision and we can't know in advance, we keep discussing forever and ever. So what's way more appropriate is looking for a decision that's good enough for now. And asking that question, can we, is this in my range of tolerance and is that decision putting our joint goal at risk opens up completely different possibilities. At least that's what I'm seeing when I'm applying it. So this is what a consent decision is about, turning that question the other way around. The, the other thing with how it operates, and I know I don't have a lot of time to speed up already, the way it operates is if you are in a crew, you are asking every single person. And you are asking, the, so you're going around and asking every single person, do you object or actually the real question is, do you have any paramount reason objection to that decision? And paramount and reason means, reason means I will say what my objection is, so it's not only that I say, well, I don't like it, it's not a veto, I have to provide a reason for it. And paramount means the thing that I mentioned before, is it putting our joint goal at risk? So it's not so much about my preference, well, whatever, I would love something else better. It's, is that decision good enough for now? Can we get started with this? So look more at it as um, more like an experiment. So is it ready to experiment with this? And maybe one, one last thing about this, no matter if you use consent decisions now, after you maybe heard more about this, um, or if you use a different kind of decision. What I find, find extremely helpful, which I also learned from sociocracy, is always put a timestamp on a decision. So it, it doesn't hurt you much saying, oh, can we live with that decision maybe for the next three months, and then we look back if it's helpful or not, and put it at stake again. This often also simplifies to not having that discussion about the best ever possible decision that we are making, but just good enough for now. Okay, moving forward. Oh, application of it, maybe already in, in your mind, ideas are spinning where you can use it. Well, you can use it with your team, even in a like, if, in a, in a small setting, like a retrospective, but you can make it really apply it anywhere. However, from the sociocratic point of view, what, the, what we say here is consent is governing decision making. So you can also make a consent decision by saying, we decide on that framework in an autocratic decision because we know you are the expert on that. So we trust you, you will check that out and then come up with a good decision because we trust you here. So it's not that it means all decisions are made by consent, but that we agree how we make a decision on a specific thing. That's maybe also an important thing. Okay, roles and hierarchies, uh, okay. I caught up a little bit of the time. Ah, right, so roles and hierarchies. So the, another typical thing that I see is that often in organizations, people are putting into positions, and I often wonder how come that that person is now fulfilling that role. I would have thought somebody else is way more capable for fulfilling that role. And so this is another decision actually that has been made and it's also an intransparent decision that's often made here and so I want to offer another way of coming up with a decision regarding um, yeah, roles, functions and tasks. And the example I want to use is one which is a little bit adapted from uh, one way where I did this, actually which fits very nice here. So it's. Um, it has been used for a conference as well. Now we are all at a conference. So these conferences work in different ways. One way is, for example, um, looking for people who are hosting the conference. And the, the conference I'm talking about right now, it's called the Retrospective Facilitators Gathering. It's a very, very small conference, 20, 30 people only, so not as big as this one. And the way it works is 
that we are looking every year for who will host it next year. And the way this happened in the past was, well, there was kind of a hidden cabal, so four or five people talking to each other and saying, oh, we think like you would be good, so we go to you and ask you, well, maybe would you be interested in hosting it next year? And you probably feel very honored that you got asked and so you say yes. And, but nobody really knows how this is working and, and why have you been chosen. So it's similar to what we see in organizations. So as you see also in, in the Agile world, we do often repeat the same mistakes. So um, this year at the retrospective gathering, I offered that um, sociocratic election. And the way it works, we are the, the people who are involved, they all start writing up a proposal. And the proposal is just like that. So I, Yuta, so I say, who am I? Oops, should touch it here. Nominate whoever I'm nominating. So, and it could be easy like that. So a post-it note. So I nominate Tom. And so we go around, everyone writes that down and then offers the proposal to the facilitator. By the way, if the facilitator is also one of the persons who is involved, then the facilitator will as well come up with the proposal. Okay, so we have a list of proposals, so this is a small group here, and we have different names here. Um, so this has been collected in writing, and we've written it up on a flip chart. And now the next thing is we go around in the, in the group, in the circle, and ask everyone providing a rationale. Why did you suggest, well, why did I suggest Tom, and why did somebody else propose Ben, and, and so on. And so we provide a rationale why we think, well, that person is really capable for that task. And one interesting thing that's happening here already is that everyone is very much in Engage into that discussion and it's often also surprising for the people to hear how other people think they can handle a specific task. So that's the interesting thing here. Okay, so we have been going around, have heard all the rationales for that. We still have that list of different names here. So what we do now is going in now for another round and ask for a possible change. So everyone who is involved, we ask again, now that you have heard the rationales the people have given, do you still want to propose the same person you have proposed before, and maybe yes, or do you want to change your mind because you've heard something else which is more convincing to you than what you have thought at first yourself. So there's a change round. And now we, have, we see here some people change their mind, and. Some people stick with the same ideas and just whatever. And then again, the same thing by this round asking, do you, did you, do you change your mind? We also ask, and for what reason? So we have as well the rationale. So I think, well, that person is maybe really capable because of blah, 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 right? So now comes maybe the weird thing, at least I thought it's a weird thing because well, I've been to facilitator school and so on. And you will realize probably why I think it's weird. Now the thing is the facilitator makes a step forward and makes a proposal, makes a suggestion. Having heard all those different proposals, what the rationales, I go forward and propose, now I don't remember who I propose it here. So I propose Ella. I think she would be the best candidate for hosting that conference next year. And the thing again is keeping in mind we are not looking for the best ever decision. We are looking for somebody we feel is capable for doing that job. And so this is the proposal and I'm, if I'm the facilitator I make that proposal and then we are going round again and this is now asking for the consent. And we have been talking about this before. So it's asking if somebody has a paramount reason objection against that. And again, the weird thing for me was like, okay, as a facilitator, if I am the one, I should make that proposal. I heard that a facilitator is neutral. Yeah, it's not interfering with what's going on here. 
Now here they're saying, well, the facilitator is more like a mediator, listening to stuff and summarizing it up and then making that step forward in order also to move forward because um, we, we don't need to discuss things right or we really want to make progress and that's the, that's the point for it. So making that proposal, going around, having a consent on this, and now the one uh, last thing I believe I'm missing here is, which is also very interesting, the person who is asked about his her consent is the one who has been proposed. Which might sound also a bit strange, but we are going around and asking everyone if they consent to it or if they have come a recent objection. And then, um, assuming you would be Ellen, I would ask you at the, the, as the last person going around. And one of the reasons is that it's so convincing and confirming if you hear the consent from everyone else beforehand. And it's not really kind of pulling you over, but it's also um, more like increasing the trust in yourself that you are the right person who can handle that. And then what I have um, experienced is, well, at least kind of often that person is then saying, well, but I'm not sure because I have blah, blah, blah. And then so for example, I don't have enough time because I have this and that on my desk. I always, always experience that then the whole crew is helping solving that issue. For example, making that step forward and, oh, I can support you with this, so maybe you can delegate this to me or something like that. So everyone is so much into it because it's a transparent decision. Everyone knows the reasons behind that and the rationale. And the last thing is, um, I believe almost always, we came up with, uh, with a person for a functional task where that person later on told me in private, oh well, often not in private, told later on, I would have never volunteered for that. And that's another thing which I find really powerful, and I guess you all have um, experienced that too, that often if you are looking for a person fulfilling a specific function <coughs> task, then it's if you are asking for a volunteer, you always get the names of the same people. And also, if you have like a, a small group of people talk to each other and say, well, who would be qualified for that? Then again, always the same people are coming up and coming to the mind. And with this approach, really completely different names come up, at least that's my, my experience with that, and that's why I find this very powerful as well. Now for, um, so that's again, that's a summary, summary of what we've done, so oh, well, the most important thing I forgot is how we start. First we clarify what kind of functional task we are looking for, right? So we know what kind of capabilities and skills we are looking for. Then we have the proposal round in writing, then we collect those proposals, we have the rationale given, we have a change round, um, then we have a summary by the facilitator by making that proposal, then a consent round, and then we celebrate. Came up with that decision. Okay. Um, application for that, actually again, all kinds of. So it's a good thing you could use throughout the whole company. Well, maybe you cannot influence the whole company, but you can influence some, some things. For example, you can influence who will be the representative in a community of practice. That's a perfect thing of finding somebody you might not have on your list right away. But it's really something that can be used for all kinds of um, functions and tasks. But the, the thing like, yeah, representatives for something, I think for that it's very powerful. And that's something where you can start also on the team level. So and hoping that this is then something that people will recognize and will copy at other places in the organization. Then, um, oh right, I have brought um, a, a quote or copy from the Scrum Guide, and I guess uh, all of you, most of you know the Scrum Guide. 
describing what Scrum is about and how it should be. And there are these three responsibilities amongst a lot of other things that we expect a Scrum Master will do. Now, um, the problem that I'm seeing is, well, I've never seen a Scrum Master who was able to do that, or was unable to do that. And the reason is, I believe, because the Scrum Master is never embedded in the company structure. And therefore, the Scrum Master doesn't have the power to, for example, um, plan the implementation of Scrum in the organization or helping the stakeholders understand and really act on it. So everything that has to do with the company, with the organization, it's just hard for a Scrum Master because a Scrum Master is part of the team, but not embedded in the organizational structure. So this is my motivation why I want to offer the, the last bit of sociocracy. And um, well, now looking at hierarchies. What we see in hierarchies is, well, the typical thing, it's kind of a top-down structure now. We have only three levels, but there can be many more, as you all know. And, well, the problem with this, especially if you compare it with Agile, well, maybe I do one more round. If you think about what's the, at the core of Agile, we have there the this typical cycle with plan, do, inspect, adapt, and then plan again, which is we do something and we want to learn from it and put that learning back into our plan, right? So in summary, what's at the core of actual, I believe, is feedback. So whatever we do, we try to acquire some feedback and want to learn from that feedback. And we do this in many ways. It is like with the with an iteration or sprint cycle, it's with the retrospectives, it's with continuous delivery, it's with the test. So everything is around, we want to get the feedback in order to get better. Now if you look at the hierarchy, there's just no feedback, nowhere, anywhere. So it's just linear and only in one dimension. And that's, I believe, the biggest problem why it often feels that the company is not supporting Agile. And it's more like a lip service and not a full service. And that's why self-organization often only can happen on a very, uh, well, um, let's say maybe fenced island but not really throughout the company. Okay, so what we need is what's called double linking. And that's a, another thing that sociocracy is, is offering. So the idea is that you don't only have the, the hierarchy top down, but you also have, if you will, a hierarchy bottom up. And uh, maybe one other thing, how, how to motivate that. We often talk about managers who are in a sandwich position, and the sandwich comes from that they are responsible for um, ensuring the implementation of, for example, a decision that has been made up in the hierarchy and is implemented below, and their teams they're responsible for. But we also expect that those managers are also kind of representatives or spokesperson or whatever of their teams and providing the information that's happening at the bottom up to the top. Now, the problem is that both is typically not possible. And that's why managers often decide one way or the other. And if they, well, if they decide like the top down, then it's more a command and control. And if they are more designing for the bottom up, but this is also something that I see a lot, then what you see at the team level that the manager is often overruled. A typical thing that I see with product owners, if they are not fully empowered, they make their decisions on priorities, then every once in a while somebody else, maybe it's the boss, maybe it's somebody from product management, it's whoever, is coming and saying, oh no, this is not what we meant, and screwing up everything again and coming up with different 
priorities. Just one example, but we see this also in, in different occasions, but I see enough people nodding that I, it seems that you all have seen that. That's unfortunate. I would have loved they would say, no, no, no. But, okay, so separating these two things out, that there is one person who is responsible for the from top down decisions and information flow, and there's another person who is responsible for the bottom up, just loosens that whole thing and also comes to well better information and better decisions so the way it's working in a sociocratic manner so first of all you have your hierarchy which is i think a really good thing because you can start where you are and it's not that i'm necessarily all in favor for hierarchies but most of the companies i'm working with like uh, i don't know the big insurance companies or siemens or auto manufacturers they just have hierarchies and now come me utah going there saying oh well hierarchies are really bad you should give up on hierarchies i don't see this happening in the next whatever 20 years or maybe not even in the next 50 years and so this is what I think is helpful with that. So you can start with what's there, and it, it's easier to implement that. And then you have on every level, at best, a sociocratic election, coming up with somebody who would be a representative of that level at the next hierarchy level. So it would be here the, um, what do I have here? The reddish guy has been elected as being a representative of this team and therefore that person will be part of all decisions on the next hierarchy level. And then again, that group of people is electing for a person who will be representing that group one hierarchy up. And also this, at least from where I'm working, it's not so easy to say like, okay, now we do this across whole Siemens or HSBC or wherever, but you can start somewhere. And the start somewhere could mean, for example, the boss, so the blue guy here is saying, oh, well, we are talking about this and that in our next meeting. And can maybe, can you please, whoops, can you please, Come along because we need your wisdom here. Um, because that's the topic you know most about that. And then you can make that as a um, as a leverage and say like, oh, maybe we should have that all the time. Somebody from the team, because somebody from the team always can make a better point of what's going on here. And this way, it's much easier to implement that. And so maybe you will be able to implement this only on this level, but not on the next. But you can start. And that's what I, at least what I really like about social policy. It's something that allows me to start somewhere. Application, and I think I said this already. Well, application, one of the things um, was I, I motivated it with this one with the Scrum Masters, expect, that we expect Scrum Master really implementing actual in the organization. So one possibility is having the Scrum Master being the double link to the next level in the hierarchy and therefore being embedded in the organization. And I, I could imagine that this is really a, a good way of doing it. However, this also means for, to me something else, which is, the Scrum Master, maybe it would be a good idea if that person is elected and not appointed, which I see typically that the Scrum Master is appointed. But if we feel like this is the person who is responsible that, well, first of all, we are represented, but also that actually is understood at the next level, we really want to be sure we have the right person here and we all agree on that by consent and electing that person. So that might be a difference to how it's done right now and, and how you come up with this from us right now. So speaking about double linking. So that would be uh, one thing. Another thing is, well, what we have often is already the top-down link, which is the often the product owner. 
Well, in some cases, I have also seen it's a sperm mask, which I think is not a really good idea because then that person cannot be really a spokesperson of the team because it's more a spokesperson of the hierarchy at that. And um, so that's why typically it would be product owner, the link, top down, scrum master, bottom up. <coughs> okay, and I have been speeding up so good that we will have time for questions. That's great. So the lessons learned. So this deciding on consent really creates a full buy-in. And you can trust me on that when I've experienced that. It really makes a huge, huge difference. And again, even if you don't want to apply all of that, just consider using it at times and consider not asking um, for, do you really like that? But more like, is it good enough for now? Can we make the next step with that? And putting a time stamp on a decision, which I think these are really important things. Then maybe you want to think about sociocratic elections. Be, well, maybe when you heard about it, you thought, oh, this sounds like it takes a while. Actually, it doesn't take so long. It's kind of a quick way of coming up with, with people to function their task, and you have to buy in from everyone. Um, then the double linking is a way to really enable an organization to allow self-organization many organizations allow enable a company to allow self-organization and you can start <laughs> at just one level just at the team level and maybe one way up so that's the the really good thing you can start wherever you are and make the next step and um, that's I believe a, a really important code because we often think it's people who are not who don't have the skills, the capabilities for self-organization, but it's actually the structure that caters it. So if you work on the structure, and the structure is like the hierarchy, but also the decision-making thing, with that, you really can implement self-organization. And I believe, uh, yeah, right, that's of course important. Um, so that's uh, a really great book on sociocracy, sociocracy a really difficult work. And <laughs> the two main links where you find more information about that, I, you're, you're taking the picture, and I have a thank you for, the, for Katya who made all the illustrations. <laughs> and I believe we have exactly five minutes for questions. So thank you. Some questions? Yeah. Uh, Jutta, um, where have you found the greatest difficulty in implementing sociocratic practices? Um, actually, I don't, well, the double linking will all to the top. I haven't seen that, not in the in the huge companies I'm working in, but I've seen it like to the next level, and then my hope is like with Agile, where I see people are copying it from software to marketing to what other departments that this will spread. So that's the, the one one answer. The other answer, the, the bigger difficulty I see is actually with that they don't really want to try it because of the term like the socio, it's kind of with extreme programming, programming, which was too extreme for a lot of people, just the name of it. And um, the other thing is that some have heard and read about holacracy and not only positive things. So that's, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, nobody can pronounce it. <laughs> I think. Ah, I know. So the the decision making principle with consent, I don't experience that as a really hard thing to implement. Not at all. And that's also something you can start everywhere or anywhere. And that's what I do. So often I don't even talk about that. I just, uh, we are in a meeting, 
some maybe I, I'm stepping somebody else on somebody else's toes, but I see we are in a meeting and we have that discussion. It goes on and on and on, and I say, oh wait a minute, I want to suggest now this and that, and then I just ask the question, asking, well, it, sometimes I turn it around and say, do you think this is safe enough to try, good enough for now? and go around this way. And it's not even, and that might be not fair, not really explaining what we are doing here, that we are deciding on consent here. And then there's, nowadays, every once in a while, there's a person like, oh, is this a consent decision? Yeah. And this is so helpful. So I, I don't see this as a big problem. And I see also people like copying that and seeing like, oh, I've seen you two doing that. That's great. Especially if you work in a multicultural uh, in, in a company, mm -hmm. you have different cultures to take the load out. Do you find it harder? Do, do you notice a big difference between cultures uh -huh. and uh -huh. people? I just realized. Do you understand the question in the back? Did you? So the question was if I experienced it uh, to be harder implementing deciding by consent said in a multicultural environment and actually I don't but what I find hard or maybe you could also say it's a smell if the joint goal isn't clear and it could happen that you try to come up with a decision on consent and you cannot get consent because it's actually not a team aiming for the same goal because if you have that question do you think that decision puts our joint goal at risk then you figure that people are really deviating and which is good to know <laughs> because you will have all kinds of troubles because of that so it's also a like actual it's a trouble detector so finding out the problems you are having so and yeah maybe it's more likely that we didn't clarify the goal up front in a multicultural environment or people have different things in their mind but I wouldn't say it's necessarily so. It's really for me more the, do we all know what is our joint goal? That if we know that, then it's really easy and can be implemented everywhere. And on the other hand, as I said already, I'm happy to know if we are having different goals. Maybe one more. Oh. Uh, what is the drawback of doing the social person? What's the drawback? <laughs> Um, huh. I, I don't really see a drawback. The, the thing is, and maybe it relates to your first question, which comes now to my mind, um, which is that especially for the double linking, that the higher up you go and the higher up you go, well, probably it's everywhere, that often managers feel like they, get, they lose their power which is actually not true at all. It's really not true at all, but that's maybe also because of that socio part in, in the term of it, but it, it's also like, okay, and then there is also a double link, and what is that, and I thought I'm the boss, but now, hmm. So that's, that's I believe, the, the half part of it, and maybe the drawback in that sense that people are then hesitant to, to give it a try, to really experiment with it. Yeah. Is this, uh, as long as they are not saying stop, I keep taking questions. Yeah. One, last, uh, one last one. Okay. So. <laughs> Can you give us a like, example that you are using for ship racing and what all the benefits? Um, if any I can, organization that it, was struggling maybe, but after using for ship racing, they have been doing um, so, I'm really using bits and pieces since I learned about sociocracy everywhere. And I, sometimes I don't even really realize that, and that's all, that would be also my hope, that I triggered something for you, that you think, oh, maybe I try that, and maybe you try it just in quotes in a retrospective, because that's a, kind of a safe environment. And once you try it, then you figure out if you are in a different meeting or somewhere else, and it, it becomes also a, a second nature of doing it. And, and again, I haven't, I haven't seen it 
being implemented across all organizations. I know that there are companies <laughs> who have implemented that, but I haven't been part of that, so I can't really tell what kind of struggles they have been going through. Um, I don't know about like the real huge ones, the huge companies and these other companies I'm in. But what I again, what I can do here, what's easy there, is to start somewhere, and that's actually, to me, it's the same thing how I started actual in those environments. It's starting somewhere, and now if we look at, especially in large organizations, there's hardly a large organization not claiming that they are doing actual, and so. Why shouldn't it happen this way as well? And maybe, but I could also imagine that people will not really talk about sociocracy, which is unfair to the people who have invented it, but that they are more talking about an actual organization because I, I really believe that sociocracy is providing answers to questions that actual doesn't have those answers, but we see those problems. So, long, long answer. <laughs> too philosophical. <laughs> okay. So, All right. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. So give it a round of applause.